ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed, all praise is due to Allah, and as such we should praise Him, seek His help, and seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves, and the evil which results from our deeds. For whomsoever Allah has guided, none can misguide, and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray, none can guide. And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last messenger of Allah. Inna asdaq al-hadith kitab Allah. Wa khayra hadi hadi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sharra al-umuri muhdathatuha. Wa kulla muhdathatin bid'ah. Wa kulla bid'atin dalala. Wa kulla dalalatin fi nar Indeed, the most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah. And the best source of guidance was the guidance brought by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion. For every innovation in religion is a cursed innovation. All cursed innovations are sources of misguidance. And all misguidance leads ultimately to the hellfire. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, in the previous khutbah, I began to speak about the sources of knowledge. What are the primary areas of knowledge that we have to seek? And that was in continuation from the previous khutbah, which addressed this primary responsibility which Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, based on instructions from Allah subhanahu wa taala, placed on our shoulders when he said, "Talabul ilmi farid ala kulli Muslim," seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. So, in the previous khutbah, we spoke about the primary areas of knowledge: knowledge of Allah and knowledge of the Messenger of Allah. These are the primary two areas. Following that, we have knowledge of the five pillars of Islam. Since Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with divine instruction had identified these five pillars as the foundation of Islam. <clears throat> so much so that when a Bedouin came to the Prophet وسلم, and asked him about what was required of him. And the Prophet وسلم, told him the five pillars, one after the other. And after each pillar, the, the Bedouin would ask, is there anything further? And the Prophet وسلم, would add, well, you may uh, voluntarily do this additional worship or that additional worship, and each time the Bedouin would say, I'll just do what is obligatory on me. And when the Prophet ﷺ had finished his explanation and the Bedouin turned to walk away, uh, the Prophet ﷺ turned to his companions and said, he will be in paradise if he's truthful. He will go to paradise if he's truthful. If he truthfully does those pillars, as he said, he would do no more and no less. So this was enough, I'll do what is obligatory on me, no more and no less. And the Prophet wasallam affirmed that that is sufficient to take him to paradise. So this is then telling us that this, this is a primary area of knowledge that we need to have. Knowledge of the five pillars of Islam, thorough knowledge to be able to fulfill 
their right. Knowledge of the first pillar of Islam actually includes what we spoke about in the previous khutbah. Belief in Allah, that there is no God worthy of worship besides him. It is our shahadatan. And that Muhammad wasallam is the last messenger of Allah. So, the knowledge that we should have of the shahadatan is what is sufficient to keep us away from shirk. Because that is the essential expression that we make when we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. This is our uh, clearing ourselves before Allah from shirk. That there would be no shirk in our thoughts, in our actions, in our words, in our relationships, it would be free from shirk in all of its forms. Of course, there is major shirk and there is minor shirk. And we should be able to distinguish between the two. So our primary area of knowledge in this regard involves knowledge not only of tawheed, in the sense of Allah's dominion over his creation, his attributes and names, as well as what it means to worship him alone. It also includes the opposite of all of this, where we direct acts of worship, we give attributes of Allah to others, we don't recognize Allah's complete control of our affairs. And we attribute things which happen in our lives to others. Or to Allah unfairly. When we say, why did this happen to me? We question, this is not fair. I don't deserve this. When a calamity strikes, if that is our reaction, then this is a reaction of shirk. People say it all the time. I don't deserve this. What did I do for this to happen to me? This is not fair. This is like what Satan said when he was told to bow before Adam. It's very similar. Satan was saying, why should I bow to this man? I'm better than him. It's not fair to be asking me to bow to this man who is inferior to me. I'm created from fire and he's created from clay. It's the same expression. But we hear it all the time. And this is shirk in our expressions. And it represents a serious deficiency in our faith, in our belief. Similarly, when we say, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is the last messenger of Allah. This is a commitment to follow his instructions, to follow primarily the madhab of Rasulullah. That's what that is, a commitment. That he is the only one who we would follow blindly. He is the only one who we would follow blindly, unquestioningly. We would not compare what he said with what we think to be reasonable and decide that what is reasonable is better than what he said. We would not find ourselves in that situation. Anybody else who has made rulings, has made decisions, has given opinions, anybody else is subject to questioning. Using our reasoning, this doesn't make sense. 
Let me hear somebody else's opinion. Maybe this isn't correct. Maybe this was a mistake. All of these are reasonable doubts and feelings that we can have for anybody. Even if it is Imam Fulan or Imam whoever. He was a human being. And he could and would make mistakes. For us to think that Imam so and so never made a single mistake. Every one of his rulings is 100% correct. And that's why we can follow him blindly. If we believe that, if we say that, then we have destroyed, we have undermined, we have violated our commitment to follow only Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam blindly. That is a violation. But it is something that we hear all the time. It is widespread in the ummah. Where each nation, each community follows a particular madhab to the exclusion of all else. Following a madhab is not in and of itself wrong. It isn't in and of itself wrong. Because the madhab represents the efforts of scholars, a tradition of scholarship, which has sought to follow as closely as possible the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we have, if we understand it like that, that they are making efforts to try to follow the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but they were human beings, meaning that there will be mistakes in their effort. Then there is no problem. We can follow their efforts. We can benefit from their efforts because for most of us, we don't have sufficient knowledge to go and extract the rulings and the uh, laws, etc. back from those original sources. We don't have this knowledge. And to claim to do so, when we don't have this knowledge, is even worse, deviation. Because for sure we will fall into grave error and we will lead others into grave error. So, Following a madhab is not in and of itself wrong. But, if knowledge comes to us that a position which is held by our madhab, the one which we follow, that this position is actually in contradiction to the authentic related rulings from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then we should be open minded enough to seek clarity get a better understanding and we approach it with that openness if we don't if our minds are just closed when somebody says it they say no i am a shafi'i end of story I will pray my kunut in every fajr. Why? Because I'm Shafi. If we do that, then we have violated our commitment to following Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam blindly. So we have to be clear on our commitment to the shahadata that we submit to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the commandments of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we don't make a distinction between the two because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself said wa may yuti'ir rasul faqad ata'a Allah whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah so Allah says there's no distinction between the two. And we should treat their commands different, in a different way from the way that we treat the commands of other human beings. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, 
لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق. No obedience is due to Allah's creatures if it involves disobedience to Allah. To Allah and His Messenger. Disobedience to Allah means not just disobedience to what we find in the Quran, but disobedience to what the Prophet ﷺ also said. So a friend of mine, fairly recent convert to Islam, who I was speaking to yesterday, mentioned that he had gone to Yemen and um, he found the people there very friendly, but he found one problem amongst them, big problem. Most of them chew hot. Qat is a leaf which they chew and so oftentimes when you see them they will have their mouth like this. They're chewing the Qat. And the scholars of Islam are unanimous that Qat is a form of intoxicant. But it is widespread amongst them. So when this brother tried to say to them, this thing is not permissible in Islam. They said, well, where is it in the Quran? You show us in the Quran where Allah said it's not there. This was their response. And of course, you will not find it said anywhere in the Quran, hot is haram. You won't find that. But you will find where Allah says, مَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever the messenger has commanded you, take it, and whatever he has forbidden you, leave it. And that is sufficient to say that this is haram by the Qur'an. And this happened in the time of the Prophet ﷺ's companions, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he was teaching uh, the community that uh, plucking eyebrows is haram. And women like to pluck eyebrows. Right. So the word got to one of the women that Abdullah bin Mas'ud was saying that plucking eyebrows is haram. And she was hafidha of the Quran. So she came to Abdullah bin Mas'ud and challenged him and said, is the prohibition of plucking the eyebrows in the Quran? And he said, yes. She said, well, I've read the Quran from cover to cover and I've not come across it. Where is it? So he quoted the same verse. مَا أَتَاكُمُ رَسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَحَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever the messenger has given you, take it. Whatever he's commanded you to do, do it. Whatever he has forbidden, you leave it. And the Prophet ﷺ cursed those who plucked eyebrows and who had their eyebrows plucked. End of story. So commitment to Allah and His Messenger in our shahadatan means fundamentally obedience to their commands. Belief in whatever they have narrated to us. Whatever Allah has narrated in the text of the Quran, when He said that Dhul Qarnain built a wall which blocked the Gog and the Magog tribes from overrunning humankind. And somebody says, where is that wall? We now have satellite photographs of the whole earth. Google Earth. We can go anywhere. Where is the wall? What is our response? Our response should be, it is there. Where exactly? We don't know. 
But Allah said that Dhul Qarnayn did it. We believe that it was done. We don't have to see it to believe it. Yes, we do say seeing is believing. That's in certain contexts. That's when you say something and he says something. We say seeing is believing. Show it to me. But when Allah says something, that is enough. That is enough. I don't have to see it to believe it. This is what acceptance of the shahadatan means. That we don't have doubts about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us. Nor do we have doubts about what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed us. When he instructed us not to sleep on our stomachs 1,400 years ago, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not ask him why. He said, this is the way the people of hell lie. He compared it to discourage them from doing so. But when he found a companion lying on his stomach, he came and nudged him with his foot, told him, don't, don't lie like that. Don't lie on the stomach. Don't sleep on the stomach. So from that generation onwards, Muslims avoided, those Muslims who knew Islam, avoided sleeping on their stomachs. Some of you might wonder, you say, well, I never even heard that. Well, yes, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu instructed that we should not sleep on our stomachs. His sunnah was to sleep on his right side with his knees bent, head under his arm under his uh, head. This is how he lay. So you can lie like that or on your left side or on your back, but don't sleep on your stomach. This is the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ. Well, a few years ago, scientists, actually about 20 odd years ago, I read an article which was published in Time magazine in which they were analyzing the latest developments in surgery on the spine. And they spoke about the various operations, new operations which had come into uh, the knowledge of human beings. They were performing on the back. And at the end of it all, they had a list of doctor's recommendations to avoid problems of the spine. Number one on the list was, don't sleep on your stomach. That was number one on the list. And they went on to explain why, scientifically, because the spine, when you lie on the stomach, has no support in front of it, just soft organs. When you lie on your back, you're directly on the bed, if you have a firm bed, and that gives support to your back. But when you lie on your stomach, all in front of it are intestines and your stomach and your other organs, your liver, etc., etc. So the spine tends to sag downwards. And they said that this is one of the major causes of what they call sway back, where people in old age, you see them, they can't walk straight anymore. Their back starts to curve. This is as a result of that. As one of the problems, there are other greater problems. Anyway, Muslims didn't have to wait 1,400 years to find out. They just stopped sleeping on the stomach. Of course, in 1989, in 1989, scientists in the UK studying what was known as cot death or SDS, Sudden Death Syndrome, where little kids who are one year old, or months old, die in their sleep for no apparent reason. They wanted to try to find out what is the cause? What has led to this? So they sent out researchers into the homes of families whose children had died and asked them to list the circumstances of the room 
temperature, all these kinds of things around the child when it died. Was the room temperature high? Was it low? Were you smoking in the room? You know, what kind of mattress did you use? A variety of different things they asked. Then they took all of this information, put it in a computer, correlated it to find out what was the common factors which would then indicate probably this is a reason. And when they put it in, the first major factor which came out of it was children put to sleep on their stomachs. So they immediately announced in the newspapers, in the UK, they passed it on to the US, etc. And to the rest of the world. Maybe it didn't reach some of our countries far away from the centers. But it was announced from 1989 Medically, people were instructed not to put children to sleep on their stomachs. And this was against conventional wisdom because the nurses, midwives who deal with small children commonly will put the child to rest on its stomach when it has colic, etc. You know, it's crying and this is gas, whatever. They put it in the, on the stomach and it seems to go away. So it was well accepted. You put them to sleep on their stomach. But now the doctors are saying, don't do it. Nine years later, statistics showed that with the promotion of not putting children to sleep in their stomachs, that the rate of cut death had dropped over 70%. And I just read in Time magazine just a week ago, them talking about other factors that they have found, but they mentioned again in that same article, that stopping the sleeping on the stomach had reduced, continued to reduce beyond that time till now over 50% further. But Muslims didn't have to wait 1,400 years to know this. The Prophet ﷺ instructed us and we do it. And that should be our approach. We don't have to have this kind of evidence, though it is useful, it is helpful, it's a reminder to us that Prophet Muhammad ﷺ instructed us based on what was revealed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the same way we accept in our shahada what Allah has said, we also accept what Prophet Muhammad has said. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the uh, blessing of understanding and accepting the instructions which he has given and his messenger has given. That we have a desire to follow, a devoted desire to follow whatever we have been told by Allah and his messenger. I ask Allah to put a love for Allah and His Messenger in our hearts, which would cause us to give up what others say which contradict what Allah and the Messenger have said. I ask Allah SWT to put sincerity in our hearts to obey Allah and His Messenger so that we may succeed and gain paradise at the end of this world. استغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم